During the crisis of the third century, more than 20 barracks emperors, men who came to power thanks to their military prowess and their troop support, rose in quick succession to control imperial Rome. The first of those military emperors was Maximinus Thrax, whose political legacy set the stage for decades of upheaval and the end of the Roman Empire. So, today we're going to take a look at how the rule of Maximinus Thrax kicked off the downfall of the Roman Empire. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other unhinged rulers you would like to hear about. Okay, time to take a trip to ancient Rome, which is a thing Maximinus Thrax never did. They say that when in Rome you should do like a Roman, but that was never an issue for Gaius Julius Verus Maximinus Augustus, aka Maximinus Thrax, because the rest of that is way too long to print on a driver's license. Despite being the emperor, he never actually visited Rome, not while he was alive at least. Born in the province of Thrace around 172 CE, Maximinus entered the Roman military in 190 CE. His size and strength gave him an edge, and he quickly ascended the ranks as he fought throughout the empire's territories. By 232 CE, he had command of his own legion in Egypt. Over the following years, he governed Mesopotamia and led Roman troops against Germanic forces on the edge of the empire, and generally checked a bunch of solid Roman general boxes. Once he became emperor in 235 CE, he fought to consolidate his power in the Germanic territories and secure the frontiers rather than head back to Rome where he would have had to trade in all that battlefield violence for the comparatively boring office work of an emperor. The strategy worked for a time, but a revolt in Africa forced Maximinus to go to Italy to defend his claim to the imperial throne. He only made it as far as Aquileia in northern Italy, where, during a siege on the city, his own troops turned on him and killed him. Ouch, not the best peer review. Maybe should have allotted more time for intramural sports. The soldiers then marched his head to Rome on a spike. It was technically the first time Maximinus Thrax ever entered the seat of his empire. And we imagine not exactly how he pictured that going. But how did things get to that point? Maximinus's military prowess and respect among his troops got the attention of Roman Emperor Alexander Severus. Severus himself became emperor at the age of 13 in 221 CE, and his mother, Julia Mamaya, profoundly influenced him throughout his reign. He and his mother traveled to Germany in 235 CE to end a conflict with barbarian tribes who were raiding into the empire. Severus planned to pay off the German tribe, which wasn't a particularly popular plan with his men. The fact that he had recently cut military pay didn't help matters either. The military turned on him, killing both Severus and his mother. Some historians say Maximinus led the revolt, and others claim Severus's mother hired an assassin to kill him. If that were the case, considering she was killed as well, let's hope she got her money back. No matter who killed Severus, the military promoted Maximinus to succeed him as the emperor without approval from the Senate. Unsurprisingly, Maximinus Thrax's battlefield promotion to emperor by his own troops was not without challenges from the Roman bureaucracy. They tend to get annoyed with military coups. Many people in Rome supported a senator named Magnus. Magnus initiated a revolt against Maximinus, conspiring with members of the military to destroy a bridge across the Rhine River that would leave the new emperor stranded on the opposite side in hostile German territory. Sort of the ancient tactical equivalent of locking the babysitter out of the house. History generally agrees that Maximinus discovered the plot against him and had anyone associated with it killed. That being said, some historians think he invented the whole thing to justify his barbaric behavior. But Magnus wasn't Maximinus's only competition for the throne. Another opponent, Titus Quartinus, had supporters in Rome as well. Unfortunately for Titus, he was betrayed by one of his most ardent supporters, Maketo. To prove his loyalty to Maximinus, Maketo cut off Titus's head and presented it to the emperor. Maximinus responded by thanking Maketo and having him executed for treason because he was apparently the kind of guy who puts anthrax in his thank you notes. It seems the Rhine River Bridge wasn't the only bridge getting burned down during his reign. After these violent initial struggles, the Senate reluctantly agreed to back Maximinus, but their support was half-hearted and short-lived. According to the Historia Augusta, Maximinus was of such size that men said he was six inches over eight feet in height, 
so he was roughly the size of NBA legend Shaquille O'Neal in a giant novelty cowboy hat. Maximinus the Giant allegedly used his wife's bracelet for a ring, pulled fully loaded carts by hand, punched teeth out of horses' mouths, and crushed large stones with ease. Many of these accounts of his enormity were obviously embellished, at least we hope. But historians and scientists think it's possible he may have had gigantism, or acromegaly, a hormonal imbalance that could have been caused by a tumor on his pituitary gland. His size certainly may have contributed to why the soldiers promoted him to emperor in 235 CE, but the Historia Augusta claims Maximinus was always clever enough not to rule the soldiers by force alone. On the contrary, he made them devoted to him by rewards and riches. Bribing your way to success is never a bad plan. And if the whole general to emperor pipeline hadn't panned out, it sounds like he could have made a decent living as a horse dentist. Possibly due to his intimidating stature, stories of Maximinus Thrax include some truly unbelievable claims. According to the Historia Augusta, Maximinus often drank a capitoline amphora of wine every day, which was roughly equivalent to just over 26 liters, or almost seven gallons. That is too much wine. He also allegedly ate 40 to 60 pounds of meat per day, which sounds more like a story you'd hear about Paul Bunyan than an actual living person. Maximinus also allegedly abstained from eating vegetables, and for some reason, collected several pints of his own sweat in a single day. Maybe he was bottling it as war juice, just so he could give a dramatic third act speech about how the real war juice was in them all along. Maximinus was, in a word, extremely paranoid. That's actually two words. The kind of paranoid that installs cameras in the laundry room to see where all his socks are going. As soon as he became emperor, he started eliminating all of his predecessor's allies and attendants, dismissing some and killing others. He feared allowing anyone to have even the slightest power over him, and put many imperial attendants to death because he believed they were plotting against him. The Historia Augusta claims Maximinus hung men on the cross shut them in the bodies of animals newly slain, cast them to wild beasts, and dashed out their brains with clubs. There's a Game of Thrones writer if I've ever seen one. These rumors spread fear and hatred in the Roman Senate, which is understandable because unless you are freezing to death on an ice planet, very few people are cool with being shut into the body of an animal newly slain. One of the things working against Maximinus Thrax was his low birth status, a point made by Machiavelli, easily one of the most Machiavellian thinkers of all time. In The Prince, Machiavelli used Maximinus as an example of how being low-born could thwart the political career of even a decorated military man who was loved by his troops. He described Maximinus as despised and hated since he had been a shepherd in Thrace, something which was very well known to everyone and made him deeply contemptible in everyone's eyes. In fact, it was his connection with Thrace that earned him the surname Thrax, and enemies back in the Roman Senate, who saw him as a barbarian outsider, tried to have him replaced. The tales of his cruelty were tied to his low-born status. According to the stories, Maximinus was as hungry for money as he was for power, wine, and meat, and he reportedly seized wealth from Roman nobility throughout the empire. But even the combined riches of Rome's most extravagant citizens wasn't enough for him, and he soon set his eyes on the Roman treasury. He seized the money allocated for public welfare and offerings from temples, and dismantled materials that could be used to make coins from public buildings. He put the stolen riches directly toward his personal wealth, which he used to prepay the military for upcoming campaigns, thus strengthening his support among his troops. Maximinus's actions upset the Roman ruling class, because they saw the emperor as working to promote only his own interests and those of the military. And it's difficult to argue with them because that's exactly what he was doing. As Maximinus Thrax waged war throughout Germany and the Danube Valley, he took his son, Maximus, with him. Young Maximus was very different from his father in appearance and behavior, but was still a skilled fighter. By appointing his son Caesar in 236 CE, Maximinus Thrax sent a message to the Roman Empire that he was totally cool with nepotism. It also signified that he was planning to establish a dynasty, which Maximus would continue. Around the same time, Maximinus Thrax had his deceased wife, Paulina, deified, further cementing his family's place in Roman power a self-appointed emperor naming his son a successor and legally making his wife a god. Yeah, that's a collection of red flags so dense it looks like a Muppet's wig. 
To prove to the Roman Senate he was a force to be reckoned with, Maximinus Thrax plundered, destroyed, and ravaged parts of Germany and the Danube Valley, reporting back all the details as he went. Not sure why they would have needed additional proof, but Maximinus was thorough in his violence. And since selfies were still a few thousand years away from being invented, Maximinus allegedly commissioned paintings depicting the carnage and majesty of his battles, and sent them to be displayed in front of the Senate. The point was to remind Rome and the Senate of his accomplishments and his strength, but the tactic may have backfired. As Maximinus fought through Germany and eventually brought peace and stability to the western part of the empire, he lost sight of how people back in Rome perceived his actions. His barbarism and drain on the empire's wealth only increased how much the Senate and the Roman citizenry despised him. When another rival, Gordian, appeared in the African province in 238 CE, the Senate jumped at the chance to support a different leader. In 238 CE, Marcus Antonius Gordianus Sempronianus, or Gordian, was the 80-year-old provincial governor of Africa. His lineage was unknown, but he claimed to have descended from Emperor Trajan, which was a thing you could just do back then. As governor of Africa, Gordian witnessed how disgruntled the population was with Maximinus's rule, particularly his spending. Taxation in the provinces was high. So high, in fact, that several of the imperial tax collectors were assassinated. The murderers took their actions one step further when they decided to make Gordian their new emperor. Gordian appointed his son, known as Gordian II, as his co-ruler. The pair gained support from the Roman Senate, which happily declared Maximinus an enemy of the state. Maximinius Thrax began marching his army toward Rome in 238 CE to squash a revolt against him. The uprising was first led by the African governor, Gordian, but he and his son died within a month of the revolt's start. Whoops, hope nobody had a lot of money riding on them. The Senate didn't waste time mourning the loss of the Gordians, and instead transferred their support to co-emperors Hupianus and Bulbinus. The Senate was not too picky about who would be emperor at this point, as long as it wasn't Maximinus. Roman citizens, however, objected to the co-emperors, so the Senate withdrew their support and named Gordian's 13-year-old grandson, Caesar. The turmoil was threatening the empire, so Maximinus had to go to Rome to establish control, which was the absolute last thing he ever wanted to do. Remember, he never set foot in Rome as its emperor. He was like the regional manager of a Wendy's. As he and his troops marched from Germany through the northern part of Italy, they stopped at Aquileia. Maximinus repeatedly attacked the city, but was unable to seize it. His troops were disgruntled from inadequate provisions and Maximinus's continued failures. So the Praetorian Guard turned on him and his son and executed them both. According to the historian Herodian, their bodies were handed over to those who wished to trample and mutilate them, after which the corpses were exposed to the birds and dogs. The heads of Maximinus and his son were sent to Rome. If your last rites included trampling and hungry dogs, odds are you were not well liked. With Maximinus' death, the Senate hoped to restore stability to the empire, but it didn't go that way. By the end of 238 CE, six different men were named emperor over a matter of months. And when the dust settled, the Roman Empire was in the hands of the teenaged Gordian III. The three-year reign of Maximinus Thrax dealt a vicious blow to the empire's stability, which many consider to be the beginning of the end for ancient Rome's centuries of strength. So what do you think about the reign of Maximinus Thrax? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.